VirtualBox hates you. That's those are strong words. Why? What are you What are you trying to run on VirtualBox? If you know, if it's not incriminating. Yeah. Sims 4, huh? Hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't put it past him. Besides, everybody knows Sims 2 is the best one. Lols. Just like uh, SimCity 2000 was the best uh, SimCity mo uh, game. I have this theory, actually, about video games that it's always the second game in a series of games that is the best game in the series. Always. I've got lots of examples. So, like the most obvious example of this theory, uh, their launcher is literally a link to their website that generates user specific launch links on your system. Yeah, that's gross. Why would you do that? Answer, because you're EA and you're evil. That's why. Um, but yeah, think about it. So, Super Mario Brothers, right? You might say, oh, but obviously the best Super Mario Brothers game is Super Mario Brothers 3, and that's Super Mario Brothers 3. Oh, yes, well, um, well, ah, uh, Bioshock, hmm. Wait, do you think Bioshock 2 is better than Bioshock 1? Because that's an unpopular opinion, my friend. Um, that might be the exception that proves the rule. But um, Super Mario Bros. 3 uh, was actually the second like Super Mario Bros. game, because Super Mario Bros. 2 was originally published as Doki Doki Panic in Japan and wasn't actually a Mario game. And uh, the Super Mario Bros. 2 in uh, Japan was a um, a level pack, essentially, essentially, and therefore it doesn't count. I still hold that the Batman Arkham series has the first has with the first launch. Ah, well, there you go. Um, well, I haven't really played the Arkham Knight games, so there you go. I'm not into things with realistic graphics, as you can probably tell. Mass Effect, though. Mass Effect, the second game, was the best one. Um, <laughs> Pikmin 2. Pikmin 2 was the best Pikmin game. Well, anyway. So, hello to the four people who are in chat, of whom Moonstar is one of them. Um, so how was the test to those people who are in the chat right now?
Hello, Daniel! Shout out to Daniel. Hmm. Okay. What parts particularly? Hello, Larry! Shout out to Larry! Well, for those of you who are just joining us, we're having our uh, obligatory post-test complaints session. So any, if anybody has any complaints about the test, I would love to hear them. I imagine I'm probably going to get a fairly lengthy response from Moonstar, who is probably working on it right now. And then we're going to talk about machine learning. All those pesky AI systems. Okay, well, oh, hello. My cat is here. Hello, cat. Give me one second. Cat, cat, cat. Yeah. There we go. Today we'll be streaming with cat. So, anyway, our lecture for today will be about machine learning. This is more of an introductory topic. That we're just sort of explaining the rudiments of how machine learning is meant to work rather than like going into any horrible depths or details. Oh, thank you. Um, so let's get started. So. Before we talk about machine learning, it's good to have a definition of what we consider machine learning to be. So, machine learning is a computer system whose performance on a particular task improves as it gains experience. So, there are sort of two varieties of this mainly. There's stuff that learns as it goes and stuff that does all of its learning up front. And then, uh, yeah... What's a, what's the test called when you drop a cat on your keyboard? Um, that's the uh, Rorschach test. I don't know. Meow, meow, meow. Um, the um. Well, anyway, so the 
machine learning systems which do their learning ahead of time, they require usually vast some vast amounts of data uh, in order to do their training, uh, which is called the training data. And then they attempt to produce some sort of something resembling a general conclusion. Um, generally speaking, machine learning and statistical methods are uh, normally almost exactly the same thing. Oh, he's kissing kisses. Hello. Um, so, uh, these basically class into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So, in supervised learning, the computer is given an example, uh, and the desired... Bleh, ah, there we go. Basically, you're given the inputs and what the output is desired to be uh, for all of the training data, and then it's supposed to come up with some way to map between the inputs and the outputs on its own, but only for things where you know what the outcome is. Um, so, <clears throat> the, the point of training data is that you know what you want the result to be. That way, like, without the result, the computer can't do anything with the data. Um, the other uh, type that you have is unsupervised learning, where the computer is just given inputs, and the goal is to identify some structure or pattern in the data, um, sort of irrespective of what humans think the correct answer is. That's another way of good, another good way of thinking about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, you're being supervised by a human being. Therefore, uh, everything that a supervised learning system produces will be subject to the human bi biases that went into the supervised learning process. Whereas, with unsupervised learning, it is entirely probable that you will be able to come up with answers that are completely unique and like often left field in comparison to what a human would think the correct answer is, which is what's, you know, that can be very, very interesting. Like, you see sometimes these, um, like, skeletal structures for uh, UAVs. I, I realize, oh man, wow, I just really dated myself by using the term UAV. UAV stands for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, and that's what we used to call drones before the word drone became popular. Um, goal, identify some structure uh, or pattern in the data. Yes. So anyway, um, there's this thing online of like uh, a, a drone frame that's been designed by machine learning, and it looks kind of like a frog skeleton. It's very cool. Um, anyway, uh, the big application of machine learning is classification. So... You know how where you have like all of these, you know, on CAPTCHA, where you have these pictures of all of these stop signs, stop signs or no stop signs, and you're meant to determine uh, whether or not there is a stop sign in the picture. So the interesting thing, the thing that they're actually doing there, is they are creating a database of classification data for supervised learning for machine learning to be able to recognize stop signs and streetlights and things of that nature. So what you're actually doing when you're doing those CAPTCHAs is you're contributing to a machine learning database that is augmenting the ability of computers to drive cars, which is kind of cool if you didn't already know that. So. Anyway, um, the goal with classification is to take data and determine some quality about it. Um, is there a stop sign in this picture? Is there not a stop sign in this picture? The, the computer, like, it's important to understand that computers don't really understand anything, right? A computer does not have an abstract model of a um, 
of a stop sign in its brain that it can apply to a picture and say, oh, well, a red octagon with a white border and the word stop in the middle, that's stop sign, and you can view it from multiple different angles and it's still a stop sign, and part of it can be occluded, uh, and it can still be a stop sign. You just have to, like, like that's, an, that's another really interesting machine learning and machine vision uh, problem is the problem of occlusion. Um, occlusion is the technical term for when... Um, something passes in front of an object and partially obscures it. Um, <coughs> that was not coronavirus. That was a cat hair in my throat. I think we all know why. I apologize. And I think it's still there. But I'm going to try to muscle through it. <coughs> Anyway, um, yes, what was I talking about? Occlusion, yes. So one of the interesting things about babies, that is like infant humans, is that they, until a certain age, they lack something called object permanence, which means that if it's not within the immediate field of view of a baby, that baby does not think that it exists. Like, when a person's face becomes hidden by their hands, their face no longer exists to the baby's mind, right? And then, when you open your hands up again and reveal your face to the baby, it's a brand new face that's just been created out of thin air, which is why you can get this reaction out of babies with the peekaboo game. But anyway, the idea is... Um, Machine machines have difficulty with this sort of thing, too. It's a thing that human beings develop very, very early on, uh, but it's also a thing that machines are working on. So anyway, um, if you think about linear regression and regression analysis in general, this is a type of supervised learning. What you're doing is you're taking a bunch of data points, and you are creating some sort of mathematical function which correlates all of those data points in an op optimal manner. Um, so in a regression analysis, um, the output values are continuous rather than discrete. Uh, so you're looking for a function rather than a label. Um, but the goal is to come up with some output values that are based on the values in the training data. So when you perform linear regression, or any other type of regression, polynomial regression, exponential regression, any type of regression you like, least squares reject, uh, regression, what you want to do is you want to come up with a function so that you can extrapolate that data past the point where, that, where you have actual data. Um, you know, so regression is a method of statistical analysis that is very, very similar to machine learning. In fact, it's probably like your best go-to mental model for the method in which machine learning works is it's a type of regression. <laughs> Pardon me. It's a type of regression analysis, but uh, it's the idea of regression applied to a large number of different types of things. So, so clustering. Clustering is another application. Um, what we're doing is we're trying, we have a bunch of points of data. And right now, this example is in two dimensions. However, it is possible to have groups of data in n dimensions, which makes it much more useful and interesting. Um, what you want to do is you want to take all of these inputs in and break it up into clusters. So you want to analyze the data in such a way that things that are close to each other are grouped. And um, the, the point of this is that the groups are not known in advance. Uh, for example, with these points here, a clustering analysis might yield something like three groups, three main groups with a number of outliers. We have the yellow, the blue, and the red. So, 
So here's an example data set for you. A number of um, famous people. Uh, we've got Lincoln, Washington, Harris, Madison, Napoleon, and de Gaulle. We have a number of nationalities. We have a number of heights. Um, and we have labels. We can see uh, all basically all of the tall people have been given label A, and all of the short people have been given label B. In supervised learning, given a set of data of feature vectors, this is what we call, um, basically, feature vectors are uh, the same, conceptually speaking, as the positions in this field of dots. So you can think of a, uh, a position as a vector, right, in Cartesian space, uh, n-dimensional. Each one of these uh, is a three-dimensional vector comprising a nationality, a height, and a label. Um, although I suppose the name could also be useful information as well. So four features here. So um, so let's say we had this additional data point. Um, we have a new person called Thomas Jefferson, who is an American. Theoretically, his height is 189 centimeters. Um, what do you think this would classify as in A or B? I'll give you a moment to respond in chat to decide. I'll wait for the answer to come in no longer. Um, this would be an A, because he's in the higher height group, if that makes sense. So, in unsupervised learning, feature vectors are given without any classification. Clustering is used to find clusters of similar feature vectors. But what is similarity? Um, yes. Yes, Larry. It is, in fact, A. But how do we measure similarity with respect to feature vectors? Well, first of all, let's construct a numerical vector to represent our features. It, you, while we have a bunch of different, um, like we're not dealing with purely numbers here. Obviously, what number is American and what number is French? It's It doesn't really it doesn't really matter. Um, what we do is we take all of these labels and assign them numeric values. That way we can do math on them. So, once we've assigned numerical val values to our vectors, uh, then we can compute a distance between vectors. Um, so, just, you know, it's as simple as taking one vector, taking the other, subtracting, and then finding the Pythagorean distance or the Euclidean distance between these vectors. So here's another data set for you. Similarity of animals. Column one is an animal name. Columns two to seven contain the feature vectors. So we are now dealing in seven dimensional space. Given these feature vectors, we need to decide if, for example, a boa constrictor is more similar to a rattlesnake or to a dart frog. So, we have a number of different um, cold-blooded animals, I guess you could say. Um, all of them chordates, I think. Yes, they are all chordates. We, we have information on whether they are egg-laying, whether they have scales, whether they are poisonous, whether they are cold-blooded. Oh, dart frogs are not cold-blooded. There you go. How many legs they have, and whether or not they are a reptile. 
So the first thing that we do is convert each animal into a sequence of numbers. So if uh, so, with respect to this example, um, if we convert yeses and noes to trues and falses, um, and if we assign true to one and false to zero, which is very conventional, then we get uh, feature vectors um, here uh, as shown, which uh, have some left off. So, aha, I tell a lie. We have a different way of calculating distance here than just um, taking simple Euclidean distance. So, have any of you guys heard of taxicab metric before? The idea is, is that um, if you have a city, like New York City, it is impossible to drive a taxicab through the blocks of the city, the buildings. You have to use the streets. And if the streets are arranged into a grid, then each one of these three lines, except for the green one, the red one, the blue one, and the yellow one, have the same distance, uh, despite the fact that uh, the blue one appears to take a lot of left turns and sort of completely neglecting the idea that traffic might be a thing, etc. So basically, what we're doing here is we are taking the sum of the differences between each of the components of the vector. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Vicky. So, when we take taxicab metric, that is the metric that we want to use with respect to our feature classification for um, machine learning. So, question. What is the taxicab dif difference between distances v1 and v2, where v1 is 2, 2, and v2, or yes, and v2 is 6, 5? What is our taxicab distance here? Vote now! A, 3, B, 4, C, 5, D, 6, E, 7. Obviously, the answer is seven. I didn't even wait for you guys. Ha! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. This is also called the Minowski, Minkowski distance, pardon me. So, it is seven. So, what is the Euclidean distance between these two? We've got three on one side, four on the other. 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 9 plus 16 is 25, 25 square root is C. Yeah, not gonna... <laughs> Snap. Um, so, we can... So here's a, a, a function in Python for calculating the Minkowski distance between two vectors. So... It's the sum of the absolute value of the differences uh, to the exponent p for i in the range of the length of the vector. And then you return that distance um, to the power of um, 1 over p. <laughs> um, so, in order to create a uh, Python function which models our animals, our animal data set that we had earlier, we have a class. We're doing classes now. Defi uh, your initializer, you've got two things, name and features. Name is, of course, the name, and features is a vector of features. Um, then we define our distance in terms of the Minkowski distance function that we just defined. Um, so, it, if you wish to... Um, add all of these data into that particular class. This would be the corresponding code. COBRA is COBRA 111101, etc., 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 etc. Notice that the code is completely agnostic of what the actual labels on these data are, right? It doesn't matter that the third one 
in the set. Oop. It doesn't matter that the third one in the set is that the animal is poisonous, right? The computer has no conception of what it means for an animal to be poisonous, even though human beings have an implicit <laughs> understanding of what it means for an animal to be uh, to be poisonous. However, you might consider the human race as having had, uh, you know, um, what is it, 500,000 years old, the, the, the human species is, something like that. Um, we've had, as animals, something like, you know, 35 billion years worth of training data on uh, recognizing and understanding what it means for something to be poisonous. Um, you know, uh, and all of that mediated by the fact that if you didn't, un if your understanding of poisonousness in animals was not sufficiently good, that you would probably die of being poisoned by an animal. But anyway, um, so just keep in mind that once again, the computer is agnostic of all of these details. However, it can generate similarness between animals. So, um, uh, this is using uh, PyPlot to generate a table. What we're doing is we're generating a similarness ranking between any of uh, all of the items in our table. And I think the bottom row is cut off, so I'm just gonna... Ooh, that's a little better. So. So, rattlesnakes and cobras have a difference of zero, meaning that the computer thinks that rattlesnakes and cobras are the same thing. Essentially. Alligators are pretty far from everything, so alligators are considered pretty far from everything. Frogs are also considered very far from thing from everything. However, this might be a function of the fact that we, in our training data, we used, come on, we used the number of legs straight up, right? So, given that most things have, uh, you know, either four appendages or zero appendages, this is extremely common among chordates, um, and you notice I've generalized legs to appendages here. You could, you could make this like this might be a f somewhat false distinction. Uh, it depends on how uh, important you consider the presence of legs, right? So you could say legs present or non-present turn that into a boolean value once again. That makes it a different situation, right? Um, however, because We've just gone straight on the number of legs and, you know, ignored all of those one-legged reptiles. Um, we have essentially multiplied the effect of the uh, the effect of legs on the on the data by a factor of four. And another thing that you could perhaps do that would round out this data and make these data and make everything uh, sort of give equal weight to all of the categories is what you do is you'd normalize all of the elements in a category by the highest value in that category. That would, um, because right now under this system, the category that has the highest maximum has the highest weight, right? But it, you know, it's, it's this kind of hibbledy wibbledy statistical stuff. But you can see that alligators and dart frogs are very uh, dissimilar to everything else, and there is more difference between an alligator and a dart frog, despite having the same number of legs, than there is between any other um, two uh, things, not excluding dart frog and alligator dissimilarity to the rest of the data set. So, anyway, so that's... Hopefully this is kind of making some degree of sense. Um, but that's 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 uh, essentially the manner in which you um, that's that's close to the manner in which you perform clustering analysis. So the step that's missing here, the way that you get it uh, from this 
conception to a clustering analysis conception is that you perform essentially a uh, you know a statistical method by which the the one that's alluded to back here um, if you sort of put these circles into the data set you know uh, and cluster these data that we've now performed the uh, the feature vector sort of comparisons um, we can use this chart to determine how far away stuff is from itself which allows us to perform a least squares regression on the data uh, although not a linear regression because we're not looking for a linear function we're looking for um, clusters so points and you know the number of points would be um, possibly a thing that the that you would just have to try it see how well a re how good a regression you get for like two clusters three clusters four clusters five clusters and you know basically take the first big dip down in the um, dissimilarity of all of the elements that are in a cluster anyway moving on to linear regression this is a type of supervised learning. In regression, output values are continuous. For example, real numbers rather than discrete, i.e. classes. So our goal is to come up with a rule that predicts the output values based on the values in the training data. So with respect to a regression analysis, we consider the training data to be the uh, scatterplot points. So with respect, well, these are actually different data sets. Okay, what's going on? Slides. Jeez. Um, so, let's suppose we have two-dimensional data points, and we want to find a function f that predicts y from x. Um, linear reg regression tries to find a line equation that approximately fits this data. C is the coefficient, b is the intercept. I probably don't need to say all of this because this is very much like grade 10 or possibly earlier math. Um, I think that you don't start doing it like, and like performing linear regressions over statistical data until grade nine or 10. But then again, I am very old and completely disconnected with what they teach in high school these days, even though I, uh, I like to make grand sweeping assumptions about it. So here is our procedure for performing linear regression. Obtain your data. Divide the data into two sets, the training set and the testing set. Running, uh, run linear regression on the training data to get the proposed coefficient and intercept, and then four, use the proposed coefficient and intercept to predict the y values of the test data from its x values, and then we measure how far our predicted y values are from the real y values in the training te uh, in the testing set uh, data set. And as we know about statistical methods, and all of these types of things, the better, the, the, the larger the data set you have to work with, the more accurate your results are going to be. <clears throat> so, so, with respect to number five, how are we intended to predict um, how far, not predict, how far are we supposed to, how are we to measure how far away we were with our guess? How far from the real y values are the predicted y values? We use a concept called mean squared error. Um, so let y1 to yn, which are the smaller case, lowercase, be the real y values, and let capital y1 to yn be the predicted values. The error of the sample is, of course, y, um, the uh, real value, value of the real value minus the value of the predicted value. And the squared error is the square of that error, <laughs> you know, um, reasonably, uh, reasonably, um, as you might predict. So, if you take all of the squared errors and you sum them, and then you divide by uh, n, 
so normalizing the size of the normalizing the errors for the uh, for the number of errors that you added together, you get with you get the mean squared error or the mean of the squares of the error. So, in fact, the regression model is intended to minimize at least the the error these this uh, mean square error. So. Linear, linear regression tries to find proposed coefficients and intercepts that minimize the mean squared error. This is called least squares estimation. The coefficient of determination, aka r squared score, is a measure of the goodness of fit of a regression model. r squared equals 1 implies a perfect fit. r squared equals 0 implies no better fit than a horizontal line. So, we will use scikit-learn for linear regression and other machine learning in Python. We're not actually going to do this, but this is how you would do it. So, um, installing scikit-learn. Install Anaconda. Done. <laughs> no, um, if you're, uh, so if you take a look at uh, the commands here, um, you will find that this is actually very similar to how to get matplot, uh, or mathplot, the, the plotting stuff. Uh, same church, same pew, as it were. Just install Anaconda. So, um, not sure why it's necessary to re review this so quickly, but... Just a reminder, for linear regression, we obtain the data, we split the data, we run regression on the training data, we then um, take that model and run that on the, uh, what do we call it? The um, testing data. And then we oop, measure our error with the testing data. So here we go. Obtaining the data. Normally, you need a data source. For our, in our case, we need a list of x, y points. This is a function that will generate a random sample for us. Um, notice we are importing random. Oof. Sorry, guys. I apologize for my ums. I know. I'm just so excited about machine learning. So... You know, it would be hilarious if somebody went through all the lectures and actually kept a record of the number of times I said, um, and then it was something ridiculously high, like 732. That would be hilarious. Anywho. So we have a function which generates sample data. We have a coefficient, a number of samples, a Y spread. This is... Essentially, in order to generate the random data, we basically have to give it the linear, re like the regression model that we're trying to find, right? So that it can generate these points around the function that we're trying to create. So, then we split the data into training and testing. So, um... For i in range length of data, if i is in indices, train.append data i, else train.append or test.append data i. So we have generated a random, another list of random numbers, which gives us a, whether to include it in one category or the other, it's, a si it's the size of the test data itself. So there are a couple of corollaries of this. Number one, the testing data might not be exactly the same length as the training data. And also, this sort of sterilizes the sample data from any biases that might be introduced via the construction of the data and the sequence in which the data was constructed. So 
if you were, for example, to take the first half of the data, make that the first, make that tr the training set, take the second half of the half of the data, make that the testing set, that's bad. If you take if you take it alternating, right? If you just write a uh, slicing operation, such as was in the second midterm, that basically slices the data into distinct sets, that's better, but still not great. Randomness is preferred. So, here's an example on actual stuff of these values being at, or these functions actually being run, random.uniform1.2 to, uh, from 1 to 2, generate random uh, sample data with the coefficient, which is random. Uh, I am so sorry about the ums. We then have training data and testing data, which are assigned from the output of training test data. So notice that we are returning a tuple and this is the syntax for assigning two things to a thing that has been returned in that manner from a function. And then we're just, at this point, printing the data. If we plot the data, this is what it looks like, using the uh, techniques that we discussed a few weeks ago. So, scikit-learn has a variety of tools for linear regression. We will use the basic one, which is called linear model dot linear regression. So from sklearn, import linear model, regression, linear model dot linear regression. So we're initializing the class. X train is equal to fix 1D array X train. We have to do one annoying step if we are doing a 2D regression with 1DX. C function on next slide. So then we do regression dot fit the X training and the Y training data. Then we get certain data out of that. We get the coefficient and we get the intercept, which is cool, very cool. So scikit-learn expects that we are doing complicated set data sets in very high dimensions, but we are not. Uh, we have to do this other extra set in order to convert a basic 2D linear regression uh, using the using the function below. So fix 1D array is return numpy.array dot reshape one, negative 1, 1. You just have to do it if you're doing it via this manner. Then we wish to predict the values using the proposed coefficient. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, uh, okay. Somehow, I go from 1F, 2Fs, to 3Fs, 4Fs! Oh my god. The mysterious hidden Fs. Anyway, so we want to use the value, the coefficient, and the <laughs> intercept that were determined using the linear regression that we were using in the last slide to see how well our data fits the testing data now. So X test and Y test are the actual testing data points expressed as lists of numbers. Then we plot them. Then we do regression dot predict X test, which is our Y prediction. So with respect to the pi plot, we are plotting the y prediction over top of the x the actual values so we're getting a visual sense of how well our data predicts the the testing data you know, might notice if you have an eye for this sort of thing that if you were to run regression analysis on these on these data as opposed to the last ones we might have ended up with a regression line that was a little bit higher in slope than what we ended up with, but that is the nature of random stochastic processes. So, number five, we measure how far the predicted y values are from the real y values in the, tra in the testing data set. So, mean squared error, smaller is better. So, there is 
sklearn.metrics, which has a lot of this kind of stuff. Import mean squared error and r2 r squared score. MSE is mean squared error. You just plug the data set into mean squared error, and there you go. Easy peasy, easy as pie. Then we've got r2 score, and we are formatting the output uh, to display to decimal places in floating port format. So there you go. That's how you do that. So, with respect to multiple dimensions, you can do linear regression with multi-dimensional data. All you have to do is add an additional coefficient for every for every new dimension that you add. So notice we've got x and y. y is the one that we are predicting, and we are starting from x. If we go down to x to the uh, so a d-dimensional array, x to the d or x subscript d is the one being predicted. And so we have coefficient 1 times x1 plus da, 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 plus coefficient d minus 1 times x d9 minus 1 plus our uh, x subscript d intercept, which would be b. So if you want to do this sort of thing, it's definitely possible. Here is what a regression analysis looks like with respect to three dimensional data. So it's important to note that with any of these types of analyses, when you perform linear regression on a, when you perform regression analysis on two dimensional data, you end up with essentially a one dimensional object, which represents that data. If you have a two dimensional, or if you have three dimensions of data, then you end up with a, a, a essentially a two-dimensional object in three-dimensional space, and if you have you know four dimensions of data, uh, four axes, orthogonal axes, you end up with a three-dimensional object in four-dimensional space, which represents your data. Perhaps we are three-dimensional objects in four-dimensional space that represent data. Mind blown. So. This is what a uh, planar regression, I guess you could call it, would look like with three dimensions of data. So, um, so we've got four minutes left in class. We're more than halfway through this set of slides. I think what I will do is I will open up the floor to any questions that anybody has about literally anything for the remaining remaining four minutes of class, and when we uh, meet again on Friday, we will cover the rest of these slides. And that will be it. The course will be finished. You will have completed Computer Science 1MD3, except, of course, for the exam, which, uh, and if you haven't handed in Assignment 10 yet. So, aside from the things that you have to hand in, we will have completed all of the lecture material for Computer Science 1MD3. So, if you have any questions, please ask your questions.
He's doing well. Um, Martin is doing well. He's, I think he's enjoying having us home more of the time. Because, you know, there was this thing that was going ar around Facebook, I guess. I don't, I'm not actually on Facebook, so I don't actually, you know, follow this sort of thing. But it was like, oh, now we feel, now we know how our cats feel being stuck inside houses all day. You know, because there's this, this theory that uh, keeping a cat as an indoor cat is somehow cruel to the cat. You know, to protect it from wild animals and coyotes and all of the diseases and parasites that exist in the outside world. Yes, uh, yeah, sure. Indoor cats are the you know the secret oppressed uh, class in our society. No, um. Anyway, it's like oh, we know how it's like what it's like to be cats now. And I would just like to point out for the record that. In order for us to have a better idea of what it's like to be a cat living in a house, take your house and multiply it volumetrically by a factor of eight. And that, like, if you multiply the size of your house by eight, then you're starting to understand what it's like to be a cat because cats are like one eighth the size of a human being or, you know, something like that. So, yeah. No, Martin's doing well. He is the Floofmeister. Yep. Yeah, he was in earlier, which, you know, I'm probably going to uh, run it back and, and see what that looked like, because there might have been a cute shot or two, which I, which I can send to my wife. Or maybe just send her the video. I keep forgetting that this is like the human beings are now progressed to the point technologically where you can just send people videos like it's nothing, you know, like it used to be a telegraph or like telegraphs were a lot more work, you know, anyway. Hmm. Anyway, I'm going to. Shut off the stream here. Take her easy, folks. Go out and get some exercise. And don't forget to drink plenty of water. <laughs>